Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank and Chase Commercial Term Lending, the Whitcoff Group, New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Greenberg Traurig, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubnight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Philadelphia? Temple University? Delaware? Adlai Stevenson? Nah, I'm gonna get involved with Soviet Jewelry. I'm gonna be involved with every political cause. Nah, maybe there's something called JCRC. Uh, I'll get involved with JCRC here, JCRC in New York. Nah, maybe there's UJA. Eh, there's, a, there's an opportunity for this fledgling little organization of Jewish groups put together, you know, 11 groups. Today is 52. Who is considered the most influential Jew in America and around the country? Who's politically con involved where people go? Who do they speak to for anything? They speak to the Malcolm Honline, the executive vice president of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Organizations. Thanks for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure. I was wondering who you were talking about. Uh, you you know what know it me. was. You, you <laughs> know, we had to figure it out who it was. So tell me about your parents, because you, you know, how they arrived in Philadelphia, and tell me about their history, because they're Bavarians. They were from Germany. My, my father was Bavarian, my mother from Frankfurt. Right. Uh, both uh, came out of Germany. My mother in 1938 and uh, came through France. Your mother was a nurse. So she was in a the, nurse in, in a place that the Jewish hospital. had the uh, Sharizetic... Uh, the, the, the precursor of what we now know as Sharizetic in Jerusalem. And uh, she was, it was the Jewish hospital in Frankfurt. She was a, an RN there. Um, actually met my father on the operating table the when he came to have an right? appendicitis, exactly. And he had been a, a student in Würzburg, in the famous school in Würzburg called Ilba. Um, and he was a graduate, he was a teacher, he had uh, college degrees, he spoke several languages, and in 1934 he was arrested by the Nazis in Frankfurt, so he left on a laissez-passer from Switzerland, where he taught in a one-room schoolhouse all the grades in all the languages, both secular and religious studies, and this was already children who were being sent away by their parents in countries coming under Nazi sway. And he was there until 1937, and uh, for a variety of reasons, had to leave in Switzerland, didn't let him stay because he then didn't have a job. He taught skiing in St. Moritz for a while, and he then traveled across Europe, actually in an entourage of the king of Afghanistan, which he latched onto, and ended up in Holland. And 
uh, as I said, my mother and father had met already in Germany. He used to come back for the high holidays because he would lead the prayers in Frankfurt at the yeshiva there. And um, my mother made the papers for him in order to leave. But as you know, it was very hard and slow process. He actually made the last boat out of Holland in Right, but he originally wanted to go to Palestine, right? Both of them were on Hachshara programs, on the preparatory programs for Aliyah. But obviously Hitler had uh, other plans. But I found, after their deaths, the actual booklets where it was stamped, how they attended each of the classes. I also found their passports. And in my father's, they had added Samuel, you know, the, uh, Israel, rather, and my mother, Sarah. And it was full of the J's. And then you, it's something they never told us in their lifetime, but I was able to piece together how she, as a young woman, 21 maybe, smuggled herself across a border into France, into Cherbourg, where she got a boat coming to, which came to Philadelphia. And you see how many times, maybe 20 times, she had to pass Nazi inspectors and Nazi checkpoints. And you think of the horror of what that meant and how she was able to do that. My father, because he'd been thrown out earlier, uh, didn't have quite as many, but he had enough to so, show what they... Now, they, they don't arrive together, do they? My mother arrives in 38, my father in June of 1940. My grandparents and aunt and uncle and cousin, did not, none of them survived. They were the only ones from their immediate families who survived. Now, how'd they end up in Philadelphia? My mother had a great uncle there, had several great uncles, but one in particular who came uh, two years earlier, and he uh, wrote and, and subsidized her coming meaning that she, he guaranteed that she wouldn't be a burden and that he would provide housing, and she, but she so, got work immediately. So your mother, uh, and I believe she got work as a school teacher, as you said. Uh, no, not immediately. First she was uh, taking care of, uh, of uh, some senior citizens, uh, medical care, and then later she became the kindergarten teacher at the Jewish day school, and she has had thousands and thousands, literally all over the world, I meet people who come and tell me what an impact my mother had as a kindergarten teacher, so people should understand how significant that really is. So, so mom is there in 1938, dad arrives in 1940. They get Were married. they married? No, they got married then in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And your father, you said to me, was involved with mechanical engineering. He was a mechanical engineer, a tool and die designer, which he became, and he worked on some high-level government projects, even though he was a registered alien because he was a, a German, but being a German Jew and having the talents that he did, they put him to work. Uh, he worked two jobs all the time. Obviously, they came penniless with nothing, and whatever money they had, they put towards getting visas for their parents which uh, to come to Cuba, and actually they got the visa, but it was already after they had been late. deported, but a short time between the two. So you have a brother, I believe, right? I do. Older brother? Older brother. And then you're born in 1944. That's what they say. That's what they say. Okay, right. you know, if I read the history. Probably books. 1984, but okay. I think. Okay, so it's 1944. And tell me about the, the, the kid who's growing up in Philadelphia. You know, let's talk about it. You, I, I had a very good childhood. My parents were wonderful. They did not lay the burden of the Shoah on us, although it was something that I knew from my early age. And frankly, I was always politically oriented from the time I was 10 years old. I got involved in political campaigns. You told me that when we got together, you got involved with the Adlai Stevenson well, campaign. Well, first Joe Clark when he ran for the Senate. And, you know, I gave out flyers and I did stuff in an office. But, but what was the... What, what didn't, Honestly? Yeah. I really understood then that if Jews were going to have a say in determining their own fate, they had to be involved, they had to learn the system, they had to become part of it. And political life, as some people talk about it as a pejorative, I don't. I believe that it's sacred if you work it right. It can be life-saving and life-affirming. Abba Ibn once said that in World War II, Jews had influence in many places, but power in none. I really believe that Jews had to have power, and you could only do it if you were involved and you do it intelligently, that you understand the system. And my whole life was geared to that. I never looked for a job in my life. Every job happened to me. But we have to get to those but jobs. I will okay. come to that. But Adlai Stevenson, when he was campaigning in Philadelphia, I snuck into his hotel suite. I walked up the back steps and came in there. I met his sons. You were, what, 14 at this time? Uh, 12. 12. And... Uh, 
he woke up. He had been taking a nap. He woke up. They brought me into him. He invited me to come and travel with him the next day. I got permission to do so. And I spent more than a day and a half traveling with him and seeing firsthand the political life and his sons. And I met many other Democratic leaders at the time uh, who were involved. I, I was never partisan and I was never ideological. I had the opportunity later on in my graduate school years to write a platform to the Republican Party on the Middle East. I had opportunities to work with Democrats and Republicans, liberals, conservatives, because the, the, to me what was important was the objective. And, and for that you can make common cause with everybody who represented decency, honesty, integrity, and who understood the importance of the issues that we cared about. Your public school, you went to yeshiva? I went to day school and then yeshiva in Philadelphia. Right, so you were going to day school and yeshiva, and then you decided to go to Temple University. I How did you decide to go to Temple University? <laughs> well, Temple, which, which I have a special affinity now because I, I got know, because a, you got the honor of a degree, doctorate two right. weeks ago, um, uh, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, Temple was, a, 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 um, it was much smaller than what it is now, but it was affordable. It provided an opportunity for many people who came out of situations like we did to be able to go to school. And I was teaching Hebrew school, and I was studying in Shiva in the afternoon, and I would go to college in the morning. And I would even, in the last two years, through a special arrangement, they let me go to school at night again to take graduate courses because they didn't think and then you that were, all the undergraduate courses. You also courses learned were. how to be a mail sorter when you were in college, <laughs> right? I did everything. I delivered chickens. I... On, on Christmas holidays, it was a plum job to get through a through political polls sometimes that you got a job sorting mail for 12 hours a day by hand into these cubbies, you know. It was good pay. It was very good pay, but I will tell you that at the end of the 12 hours, you know, your eyes were crossed. But, you know, young people today don't know it was necessary. If you wanted spending money, you earned it. I delivered drugs for a, a drugstore in my neighborhood. I did many things after school and during summers and I worked during the summers in camps, and, uh, you know, I appreciated the value of work, and I liked the independence. But, but you, were, you were a kid from Philadelphia. You really didn't know New York, which you'll get later on in your life. Right. So, so after That's you true. finished Temple uh, with a degree in po uh, political science, you, you, you increased the number of Jews in Delaware by going to the <laughs> University of Delaware, right? Yeah, I doubled the Orthodox Jewish population right. when I, I, I went there. And then I realized that it wasn't for me. I went to check it out first. And uh, while they were very generous, they gave me a huge DuPont scholarship. But I realized that that wasn't for me. And during my years in Temple, I became very involved. I was vice president of Hillel. I started the Philadelphia Union of Jewish Students, then the National Union of, J of Jewish Students in the United States, and became active in the World Union and on the executive committee and uh, uh, became a leader in the World Union of Jewish Students. I became very active in Soviet Jewry. And those things would have been missing at, in, at in Dover. And the whole society and being single, et cetera, would, it, it just didn't feel right. And I got a, a letter then at the same time from Penn, University of Pennsylvania, saying that I'd been admitted to the school for, to study international relations and with a scholarship, a partial scholarship, so that, so then the you choice get, was clear. So you had, and that's where you got your PhD. And I did my doctoral course. I did on a master's, and then I finished my doctoral coursework, and I was teaching there. I taught in t uh, political science. I was a teaching fellow. I was also a research associate at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and uh, I also got a National Defense Fellowship there in Arabic, of all things. Uh, I really had a great time in college, but all that time I was also teaching Hebrew school and then got married, so I had to also so earn money. So now you're 23, and you get involved with the JCRC of Philadelphia. Right. I got a call in the middle of the night from the Consul General saying, you got to do this, there's a job at the JCRC in Philadelphia. And again, as I said, I had been very involved on a national level and a local level in student stuff. I was a vice president of the American Zionist Federation, student vice president when they formed it. I was active in many uh, causes, and uh, so I went there, I met with them, and I agreed to do it. I was in charge of interreligious inter affairs, youth affairs, the international as agenda. You, as you've always done in many of your careers, they were smart organizations with a small staff, a.k.a. next to me. no. It was yeah. you. <laughs> so after that, you get an opportunity a couple of years later 
because of your heavy involvement with Sobri jewelry, but now you have the kid from Philadelphia has to come to New York City right. with so get really called, nobody. Right, by people you knew well uh, who had a committee because they decided to create the New York Conference on Soviet Jewelry and the National Conference. It was the first time the establishment, quote, uh, stepped up to the plate in a formal way. And then, then you got arrested in Russia, didn't you? So in six Soviet months Union. before I moved to New York, I, my wife and I were asked to go on a special uh, mission to observe a trial that was to take place of a Jew in Kishinev, in Chernovitz, actually. But while we were in Kishinev on our way, we got arrested and uh, had a bit of an ordeal for 55 hours. We, we were traveling to, tr to get away and get out. And uh, thank God we came out. And for 25 years after that, they barred me from... Soviet Union. And in 1998, I was in Russia and uh, we had gone to talk to them about transfer of technology to Iran. So Chenner Mirden and I got into this very intense exchange and he finally said, look, I have two guys waiting to see you. He will talk to you about the details. I will deliver what you wanted in the morning, which was the executive order. In fact, he did. And Al Gore was there as vice president trying to get it at the same time, but he delivered it to my hotel, not to the U.S. Embassy. And we went, and there was a guy in uniform and Kokosh, who was in charge of this. To make a long story short, we sit down, we talk. The issue of Islamist terrorism and fundamentalism comes up. This guy in uniform goes off like a rocket. I said, excuse me, you weren't introduced to us. He said, my name is Vladimir Putin. I'm head of the KGB. And it was like all the air was sucked out of the room. So after the meeting, and we had an hour and a half of the most in interesting discussion with him. He's a very smart and shrewd guy. And at the end of the meeting, they came out with canopies. So I just sat and then vodka. And all of a sudden, I see a glass come and snap down in front of me and a glass of vodka being poured. And it was Putin doing it. So I told him, this is very strange. He said, why? I said, the last time I met you guys, you arrested me. He said, when was that? I said, 1971. He said, where? I said, Moldova. He said, that's why we got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were with Soviet jewelry for how long? I was there from 19, till 1976. So in 1976, there's another, the creation, new creation in New York, okay? Because New York never had a Jewish Community Relations Council. And they find the guy who had been, let's say, the rebel rouser, the troublemaker. Who, who but a took, unifier who brought the who establishment brought, and the communities together, who built an organization that en en encompassed the whole Jewish community. Soviet Jewry became a rallying point for everybody. It broke down barriers that had existed till that point. And, uh, and I think, again, the great achievement there was building a movement, not an organization. So now you start another fledgling From scratch. <laughs> so I started Soviet Jewry the first day with a $75,000 deficit. Thank God the federations and others came through. Uh, then we started JCRC with uh, George Klein, Dan Shapiro, Rabbi Israel Miller, were, had formed a committee that was working on f uh, helping make it happen, and uh, the Consul General Rivlin, Jack Weiler, others. Uh, and so I went there because I really believed I spent my whole life in umbrella organizations because I really believe in the unity of the Jewish people and the need to create vehicles where people can come together and not be divided. And that when we're together, we find that the difference is pale in comparison to what we have in common. And the JCRC, I thought, was a really critical thing to bridge the outer communities and Manhattan. Uh, many of the leaders who came in had never been to a borough park, to, to right. Garden Hills. They, they were very insulated. And uh, people like Larry Tish, Peggy Tishman, Dick Ravitch became the chair people, the most amazing people. And it became a, a real vehicle, and thank God it exists till today. We built it up into a staff of 14. So, so what happens a couple of years later? It's not a couple, it's like 10, ten years later. Exactly. 10, ten years ten. later, um, UJA Federation, the, the, the big umbrella arm, as everybody would say, in, in the Jew, New York Jewish community, says we need an executive vice president. They, and, and the person that they really wanted to take was interviewing was Malcolm Holmley, right? They and offered it to me. They, 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 I know they offered it to you. And then you, there's the great story about you and your son going home with a bottle of schnapps, okay? Or the great well, the bottle of schnapps was with, with somebody else. Okay, <laughs> with him it was... Yeah, he, was he was 12. Scratch. He was 12 or 13. He was 12 or 13. Right? So you, you, you talk to your son. What does he say to you? What, tell me the... I had gone through 10 days of living hell trying to decide because both jobs were important. They had offered me the President's Conference because my predecessor right, because died she... suddenly while giving a speech on the very day that the search committee at UJ Federation made 
its recommendation. And, uh, and I, I was truly honored. It's something I would have done with great uh, appreciation and, and uh, had looked forward to it. And then this opportunity came up and it, it, it was really difficult. Everybody was calling me from the prime minister to the Lubavitcher Rebbe to all the leaders I had dealt with uh, over the years. I mean, literally a hundred calls a day were coming in or, or, or messages saying, take right, this one, because, take that you know, one. They were, and this was because they things. were both important. Right, they were both important, but as you said to me, and one was paying much higher. And your son said... More this, than triple. <laughs> okay, the, the, and my the son, compensation. And, we, and your son said to you? You'll never do anything for money, so where can you really make a difference? That's what you should do. So that you go to it. this organization which had been founded... Um, maybe 25 years before, but it was really a fledgling organization. They had 11 groups, 11 major Jewish... 14, I think. Four, yeah. uh, maybe. Four, uh, between maybe 11, 11 or 14. Uh, there was 11 know. at that right. time. And uh, who were the groups at that time, the initial... Well, it, it incorporated the, uh, the synagogal groups, um, ADL, Hadassah, uh, Young Israel, a few others uh, that were there. But the Orthodox Reform Conservative groups were there. Um, B'nai B'rith, uh, and several others. So over the past how many years? Mm, almost 30. 29, right? It's 29 you, years. Yeah, you reminded okay. me. You know, know. Over the past 29 years, the conference, which is the voice of the community, um, and, uh, and outreach, I mean, I was fortunate a number of years ago to go to the White House with you for a state dinner mm -hmm. when I was the president of American Ort, and, you know, ha has done unbelievable things and, and you know as we said it's a sparse operation you know there aren't that many people over there um, and it's grown from 11 to 52 I believe you have 52 organizations today so what's the major mission today would you say of the of the conference it's the same as when we started when the conference was created it was at the instance of John Foster Dulles who was then Secretary of State who said the Jews should get their act together I don't want to have five different meetings with Jewish leaders then it was five Imagine what he has with 50. And we don't impinge on anybody's autonomy and the right for them to take their own positions. What we do is provide a forum where people could come together. No organization today alone can meet all of the challenges. By coming together, finding out what we have in common, sharing resources, expertise, maximizing the resources. And our big issues today, Iran, anti-Semitism, the BDS movement, the endangered Jewish communities that we were seeing in Argentina, uh, Jews in Turkey, Jews in Europe, um, and of course, overall, the U.S. Israel relationship in all its manifestations. We have such a full agenda, perhaps more than any time in, in the 50 years, and I think the conference's role is more important than any time in the last 50 years. And, and over the years, I mean, you, the interesting story that you and I said is that you've served with two Tishes. Uh, right. One is Chairman uh, Larry when he was Chairman of JCRC, and Jimmy uh, was President, Chairman of the Conference of Presidents. Conference of Presidents. And we've really had a tremendously illustrious group who are selected by the members. I do not participate in the vote, contrary to what people think. I don't, cho don't choose it. It's really done by the members. And what is it, a two-year term? It's a two one-year terms. And the fact is that we do have an open and democratic process, it, whether it's about membership, there are criteria for membership, there's a membership committee, reviews everything that's broadly representative, and then it comes to the full conference for a vote. And what, what is essential is that we retain the confidence in the members, that we provide them services. We do not have a PR person. I don't have, and if anything, our big sin is that we don't communicate enough about what we do. But I prefer people to know what we do by the accomplishments and... Uh, I don't have a development person, so we have a limited budget. Right, but budget. as you said to me before, you are political involvement, but you're not saying it's a Democratic, Republican. It's, it's concern. not partisan. It's not a partisan. We are very political, but we're not partisan. Not partisan. We maybe. are involved with the president. We are the body to whom the president will turn when, in most instances, when he ha there's an issue to address to the community. We work with the members of Congress. We work with many foreign leaders every week, in, in, in fact. We work with uh, leaders of other ethnic groups. We have spun off a number of amazing programs like America's Voices in Israel, which brings movie stars, Hispanic leaders, black leaders, Asian Americans to Israel. It's one of the most successful initiatives of its kind. We have um, uh, Rethink Israel, which is an outreach program, especially the young people, to talk about Israel outside of the conflict and give them a different image in con uh, to contrast to the 
lies and distortions. We have uh, the Lawfare Project, which defends Jewish interests and Jewish students and uh, fights against the use of national and international law against Israel, against the Jewish people in, in the United States. We have 400 lawyers, half of them non-Jews, who work for this. Uh, we have SCAN, together with the, the JFNA, which deals with security issues. So these are all things that we're involved with, but our name doesn't appear on them. Now, in addition to this day job over here, you have a couple of other jobs. <laughs> You're on the John Bachelor show. Uh, twice a week. Twice a week, on Monday and on Thursday. Monday for half an hour alone, and Thursday for an hour and a half. And what we'll do you on talk on John Bachelor's show? About all the issues that are going on, especially Middle East oriented, but not just Israel, like we will talk about. We were the first to talk about Yemen and the danger of the Houthis uh, more than a year ago. We talk about what's going on in Iraq. We will talk about some of the trends in the world, anti-Semitism also. Um, we recently talked about the situation in Argentina. Uh, so I bring on experts. I bring on ministers and officials from Israel to talk about what's really happening. Right, but, you know, the, so what that's also doing is it's increasing awareness about the conference because you're the executive vice president. Right. And, you know, John Bachelor all, across the all over the country over there. Over right. there. In addition, for the last 20 years, you've been with Nakam right. on Friday. Right, on J.M. every J. Friday morning. Every Friday morning. Which has built there. a very loyal audience. There are people who tell me that they have one radio set aside because sometimes the signal is hard to get, that, that they never move it during the week because they can only get it there. But mostly people get it on the Internet and, and Bachelor. We get 30,000 podcasts downloaded every Thursday night from the show. It's really amazing. He is a, does a terrific job, as does Nachum. So let's talk about family. You've been married uh, for many years to your wife, right. the, the woman who grew up in New York. but uh, Born in California, grew up in New York. Right. And, tell and me went about to Philadelphia for a couple of years, and then when we moved back. Tell me about your children and grandchildren. I have four amazing children. Uh, my oldest is, is Hanoch Robert, is married to Ilana and has five children. Two of them are married. Next, my first daughter is uh, Sarah Sherry. Her husband's uh, Joshua Stein. He's a lawyer. The next one lives in Teaneck, Meira Bach, and her husband, Sander, who is a lawyer. Sarah also has five children. Meira has four. And then my last is uh, Javi Eva, who is a lawyer, and her husband's a lawyer. He's, and uh, they have four. And in addition, you serve on a number of... Um, Public company boards. Yes. Scores of community and Sco endeavors. Scores of community endeavors. And uh, I've been fortunate to know Malcolm Honline for many years. And the community, the nation, the world uh, is, is better because there's a guy by the name of Malcolm Honline. Thanks for being here today. No, thank you. And thank you for all you do.